For those of you who are new or haven't been here in a while, the point of the programming is twofold. One, to make sure that you meet someone new or build a deeper connection with somebody in the community. And two, to learn something new. And I am so excited and proud to have Amy today. Thank so you. since we have two goals, we always start first by having you guys introduce yourself, say who you are, what you do. Um, well, I know that is a time-consuming process, but the reason we do take the time to, to do it is so you, by the end of the day, or not the end of the day, we're gonna sit here all day, ladies. <laughs> by the end of this programming, there's hopefully someone in the room that you're gonna make a point to go get to know and connect with. So today is the first time we're bringing back Power Up Coffee from pre-pandemic, like I said, but we're doing it a little bit different. We are on the Power of Coffee, second Wednesday of the month, doing a fireside chat. We actually said I need to not call it a fireside chat because of the temperature. Yes. <laughs> I was like, almost or something, being yes. funny, you know, yes. like jeans and yes. hiking boots. Yes. Yeah. Go, like around the campfire. But um, the idea behind this event is, you know, leading a workshop's great, and we love workshops, and that's going to be the next week's. But it's also nice to really get to know a member and have the intimate connection and be able to ask them questions on top of the questions I'm going to ask. And I get to pull out all the fun things about Annie. So the way we always start events, um, I have serious ADHD and I hate just reading and listening to bios. So if you feel that way too, we choose not to start that way, even though Annie has a very impressive bio that you should read on LinkedIn. I think it's on LinkedIn. But instead we start in a more fun way because the teacher in me likes to take it on back. So we always start interviews by talking about your first job and your current job. And I think it's a little bit more fun to start that way. Okay, so my very first job ever was doing graphic design for a magician. <laughs> in high school? <laughs> Actually, it was one of my summers during college. Okay. okay. And they had, it's a national magician's <laughs> Like you can buy tricks and you know, like cut the lady in half boxes and all that kind of stuff. Um, the Stevens Emporium, and I helped design their catalog, and I actually also worked in their shop and sold wigs during Halloween. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. Um, but my first job as a professional was as an autopsy technician. Wow. So I did autopsies for six months for the county coroner before I went to grad school. Which county? Sedgwick County in Wichita, Kansas. Ah. And then your current job? <laughs> I am currently a medical illustrator and I do anatomical and surgical drawings primarily for jury education. So if any of you, I just talked to Emily about this last night. If any of you are selected to a jury, and all of a sudden you're in the jury box and the lawyers start talking and it's like a very complex scientific case or a medical malpractice case about surgery, I will have worked with everyone to create drawings so that you can understand what they're talking about. Instead of trying to figure out what they're speaking from operation reports or MRI reports or whatever, I just make it a picture book. And I know no one else in the audience is necessarily going to pursue this path. <laughs> um, the theme of this month is uh, business in the digital, digital age. And while, yes, she has a very specialized career, she has really excelled in her career. And I think there's a lot of universal lessons and interesting things. And let's just be honest, I think her career is fascinating, aside from like you all being able to take a lesson away from it. So before we go to more universal lessons, I just want to explore this a little bit more because I find it fascinating. Um, this is a field that's very unique. That ha How many of you guys have ever heard of this field prior to here? Like, here yeah. Okay, two. Oh, it's a STEM job. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I have this thing where I'm like, did you know this is a STEM job? And yeah. medical illustrator is one of, yes. I, I really want to talk to you. I oh, had, I was like, it's a STEM job. I had no idea this career existed until I met her two and a half years ago, and I've been courting her to be a member. She might not have realized that, but I've been like, hey, Eddie, hey, Eddie, hey, Eddie. And eventually, I wore her down, and she joined, but I'm not up here pressure. Um, but I do think it's really interesting because it's a field that many of us would never, like what I'm so proud of of RISE mm -hmm. is that, that there are so many women from very diverse backgrounds right. in you know, helping people to understand that you don't have to have a linear path. Um, so I'd love to hear how Arky got into such a unique, well it sounds like she's had unique jobs all along. Like, yeah. Working for a magician, doing autopsies. <laughs> 
So you've always been a little unique. Like, I was yes. gonna say unique. You don't um, call people weird. <laughs> I was definitely interested, like, at a young age, I love science. I also love to draw. Um, my mother, that's how she would keep me quiet. She would always bring paper and pens. And wherever we were, she would just be like, just draw something, just draw something. So my background <laughs> was <laughs> art, yeah. And I loved drawing and I loved art. And there was a time we were in a restaurant with my mom and dad and my brother. And I was doodling on the back of the placemat and I drew the digestive system. <laughs> just like, a doodle. how, in how a do restaurant. you even know what it looks like? Yeah, and I love to draw maps. Okay. And like the places we had been and like the states and bird's eye views of things. Like I was always kind of a detailed drawer. I wasn't like a free art, you know. Purple cows. I was not an abstract artist by any means. Right. Um, and it all kind of boiled down to one day. And it was like a week before freshman semester started in college, undergrad. And I'm with my mom, and it's when you find out what dorm you're gonna live in and where the cafeteria is and where the freshman parking is, like really, really far away. And they're like, okay, everyone divide up into majors. And I was like, I'm a freshman. I don't have to have a major yet. Like, what are you talking about? My eyes got really big, my mom's eyes got really big, and I just started walking with the art majors. She's like, oh, no, 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 no. What are you doing? <laughs> And I was like, well, Mom, I'm, I'm really good at art. I can change my mind later. And she goes, no, 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 no. What else do you like? And I was like, well, I like my anatomy class. And last semester, we got to go to the medical school and see the cadavers and blah, blah, blah. She goes, well, then you should go with the pre-med students. And I was like, Mom, I don't want to be a doctor. She goes, you can change your mind later. <laughs> oh, Mom. Yeah. So I ended up pre-med for four years and realized that somebody has to draw all the pictures in the anatomical books, the biology books, the molecular books. Everything is taught with diagrams or images. And it took me a while, I did autopsies for a while before I found the medical illustration career path. How did you find that? Um, so while I was doing autopsies, I had a good friend whose father was a doctor who was talking to another physician about me because, well, I used to date his son. Anyway, long story short, this other physician was like, I've worked with a medical illustrator before at the Mayo Clinic. I'll get them in touch. So I spoke with this woman. It would have been like 1998, I think. I spoke with this woman at the Mayo Clinic that was a medical illustrator. And she's like, this is the website, we have an association, these are the medical schools that have a master's of illustration, and this is where you go and this is what you do. And it's so funny, now that I went to the medical illustration program, I got my master's, I was on the board of our association for four years, I'm completely entrenched like in all of the medical illustration world, and I've talked to all like the old crew, and none of us can figure out who that woman was at the Mayo Clinic that I talked to. I'm like, damn, I wish I could remember who oh, she was. Oh, you never know how that one moment in your life can change your life. Yeah. So anyway, now I'm a total medical illustration geek. I love promoting it. I love getting students that love art to think about the science side of it. Even kids that do gaming and video games, there was an entire side of that in the medical field and in the pharmaceutical field. And also taking all these kids that are going to medical school that don't really like going to medical school, they just don't know what else to do. Dr. Lawrence, it's like, hey, what do you think about doing this side of healthcare? Because um, it's a great mix. I it love really that. Is. Isn't that fascinating? I think that's so interesting and I, I love, well, that's why I was courting her for two years because all I can think about is our mentor program. My whole why and rise is I want a young woman to say I want to be X and we need X in our community. Yeah. And so while none of my young women are going to say I want to be medical illustrator, they might say, I love art and I love science, but I don't know what feeling to go in. And I'm like, right. I got my girl for you. Yes, I have a booming industry yeah. for you. Well, getting to more of the theme of the month, the business in the digital age. You know, it's so interesting to think, you know, you say in 1999, yeah, 98, 98, I think you know, right around school. the 2000s was when the, the dot com, you know, bust. And then really, what is it, 2008 when Facebook sort of became a thing? It's yeah. funny, when Facebook first came out, my, I was a teacher and I was like, I'm not getting on that. 
was for kids. You know, I was so snobby about it. And now, yeah, I don't even talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think it's really fascinating to see how much the world has changed because of social media, because of these digital platforms, things that. You know, business growing a business in the old in the old days. That's right. right. I'm not just growing business before the digital world. It was really like TV ads and billboards and book conferences. Things. You had to shake hands. You had to be mm -hmm. networking with people. I think the digital world, in many ways, has, has democratized business in some ways. In the sense of you don't have to have millions of dollars to get your business in front of people. When I, when I started Rise, I didn't know that. Bit, your finance people are going to hate me for this. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that businesses were supposed to have a specific budget for marketing. Like somebody once said, like, <laughs> oh, Wash U students did something with my finances. Uh, like I let them into my books to learn. It was like managerial accounting or something. And they were looking at it and they're like, huh, your marketing budget is like nothing. And I was like, I'm supposed to have a marketing budget? <laughs> they're like, seven to ten percent or something like that and I was like these are things I didn't know because I didn't have to because we could do everything digitally and I just did it all right, right. so the world has definitely changed and business has changed because of the digital world while well, you're not necessarily having to well you, you have grown your business a little bit but before we go to that like how has it changed your business in terms of like art itself because you can imagine back in 90s or 2000 it was right. a lot of hand. Yeah. yeah, so I used to, I would get all the medical records and the radiology and I would start a sketch. Then I would refine the sketch and it was like a layer, a layer, a layer of tracing paper as you refined it and got it exactly how you wanted it. Then you would scan it in and then once it was in the computer, you'd like color it in Photoshop, <laughs> you know, with a tablet. And since then, part of it is me. Now that I've been drawing with a, a tablet, a drawing tablet for so long, I can actually sketch directly into Photoshop. I don't have to draw on paper wow. anymore. Um, but it has changed everything. Nobody has the big bulky scanners anymore. Um, the tablets have gotten way better. And I do everything in Photoshop. You can even do three-dimensional 3D models in Photoshop now. Like the technology is insane. Mm -hmm. I can take a client's CT and put it in a free software on my Mac and literally hit one button and make a 3D model of the bones. It's just insane what we have now. It's really cool. Okay, so that's on the specific to your business. Mm -hmm. What about like business itself, growing right. your business? Like LinkedIn is huge. Yeah, how, how have you used that? Um, so because my main client base is attorneys, LinkedIn is a safe place to find them and network with them because they don't want to chat, they don't want to Facebook. Plus, attorneys cannot be on Facebook because the jury will instantly look them up and be like, oh, who's this person? And they want to see all their personal stuff. But there are some attorneys that I am very good friends with that I've worked with for about 20 years that I do know their Facebook account. It's usually a different name or whatever. And if I'm trying to get a hold of somebody on a case, I'm like, where are they? Where are they? I'm like, they're on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I know where they are. That's why they're not returning my call. So social media is a great way to find people. It's a great way to know where people are. It's a great way. What I love is if I take a call from a brand new attorney that I've never spoken with before, I'll go to their website and pull up their picture while I'm talking to them. It'll help me remember who they are. Yeah. Um, okay, and of course, very visual. now that everything is on Zoom, that is not only helping the attorneys save a ton of costs on like traveling to do depositions and everything, everything can just be done on the screen and it's completely changed the way I've done the artwork. Um, which I was already kind of starting to do. But traditionally, it, like if you're my jury box and I'm the attorney, I would have an easel with a giant board with the drawing on it and I would talk to you about it. And if there were words on there, it'd have to like be scooted closer to you or some people might not be able to see it. And if you have a lot of things to draw or to show, you'd have a ton of these giant boards and they're heavy and they're obnoxious and they don't really fit in the car. So you'd be like calling to like rent a van to move like 15 boards and it was a mess. And as the courtroom started getting more digital and they all would have screens, they all would have projectors. I basically, I still do the same sorts of illustrations, but no words, no labels. They're really, they junk up the screen and I always have only one or two illustrations on the slide. And I put them in PowerPoint, but it's not like a PowerPoint presentation with transitions and labels and arrows. I just use that as the vehicle to show the slides. And I'm gonna pause you. Even though you all aren't gonna have juries, 
I think she's hitting on some really important points with PowerPoints. I still to this day see people doing presentations with all this muck. Yeah, no words. Yeah. yeah, and as a, a person in the audience looking at it, I'm often not listening because all I'm doing is trying to read what the heck's going on on their slides. So I think yeah. this is a really important, interesting right. thing to keep in mind mm -hmm. from a yeah. visual standpoint. And now that everyone's doing everything on screen, some people are probably doing their Zooms on their phone. Some people are on a screen and you know everyone is distracted. So even if they're present on the Zoom screen, you know they're probably like looking on their phone at the side and stuff. So now I keep my images even more simple and like it'll literally be the person's face on the slide. And then you click to the next slide and because there's no, it's not a swipe, it's a click, you can animate it. So you can literally go from normal to injured and go back and forth and actually make the injury happen or make the bone yeah. break. And so you have to get more creative on how to keep people's attention and simplify things more and show less. I think that's really relevant to everyone's business because that's the hardest thing. So while I think business in the digital age has democratized it, I also think that there's so much content out there and it's so accessible, then it's how do you cut through the noise? How do you stand out? How do you right. catch people's attention? But actually, I gotta digress because there was something you said that I wanted to talk about before we go down that path. LinkedIn, you brought up lawyers. Yeah. You know, when you first started business, I feel like everyone asked you that question of target market. Mm -hmm. Did it, yeah, I'm going to go to things ahead and nods. I hated that question for years. So I'm like, rice is for everyone. <laughs> you know, and I work with a lot of women in business and it's so hard. I feel like so many of us, maybe not all of you, have a hard time really, you know, they tell you to niche down or be really clear on who your person is. But for many of us, it's really scary because mm -hmm. you're like, well, if I'm only going after lawyers in this right. really special field, mm -hmm. how will I have business? But I think you're a really interesting example of actually when you do really niche down and you're really clear who you go after, your right. business is booming. And so to clarify, most medical illustrators and animators work in healthcare and pharma and they're in veterinary and anything. So the niche market of working for attorneys as a medical illustrator is even smaller. So we estimate that there are 2,000 medical illustrators and animators in the world, oh and only 20% of us do legal work. So that's about 400 people in wow. mostly North America doing what I do. And for me, as a medical illustrator, that's really scary to be like, okay, I'm gonna go into this tiny niche of a tiny niche market, but it's been amazing. Knowing that most medical illustrators have a much broader option to work in publishing and medical textbooks and surgical planning, which is awesome, and patient education and all these other things. And so when you were scared about that, because I had to have been scary, you know, and there were moments when you maybe didn't have clients, what kind of things helped you to keep moving forward and really get after who you were right. trying to get after? And how did you leverage LinkedIn to do that? Right, um, so mm -hmm. I was, because I had done autopsies and I was kind of like, the weird girl in Unique. school. Unique, <laughs> unique. Um, because I enjoyed forensics, as a, in the medical illustration school, so it's a two year program for the masters at a medical school. And at the time there were six medical schools that offered a, a masters of science in illustration. And now there are only four medical schools that do it, but they take more students. Mm -hmm. So like the University of Toronto takes 16 students a year. So oh. we're graduating 44 medical illustrators wow. a year oh. out of Georgia, Toronto, Chicago, and Hopkins. Wow. Yeah. And so how how do you, since it's right. such a unique field, how do you stand out in LinkedIn? Right. And what do you do? Like, how, do you just see a lawyer and say, hey, lawyer friend? No. <laughs> so I'm a medical illustrator. I was very lucky coming in with a very interesting forensic and actual anatomical background. And there was an attorney who was looking for a medical illustrator that called all the medical illustration schools. Mm -hmm. And one of my professors knew that I was kind of into the injury and gore. <laughs> and so they suggested that I interview with the attorney. And so my first job as a medical illustrator was actually inside a law firm. So I worked for a law firm for five years. And the beautiful thing about growing a business with attorneys is that they form partnerships and they form law firms and then they get in fights and they break up. Yeah. And then they join and they have more 
bigger you know, law firms and partners, and then they break up and then they spread out. So even if you have like five really good attorney clients, eventually they're going to kind of blossom. So there's a natural growth with law firms. And then also, once, you, once you're doing a really good service for someone, you're creating a great product for someone, they don't stop using you and they refer you out. So it might be me on LinkedIn saying, oh, I don't know if you guys know Lorraine Parker, but she's like the most amazing medical malpractice attorney in Denver. Oh yeah, I worked on this case for her. We just had a big settlement. Congrats, Lorraine. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh my gosh, you worked on that case for Lorraine? Um, so do you guys see how she's leveraging social proof? To, right, and then you get other attorneys that will also refer me out. And it's just a matter of, it's still shaking hands and kissing babies. Mm -hmm. It's just digitally, but it's mm -hmm. the same thing. Oh, and that's interesting. So how do you yeah. shake hands and kiss babies uh, digitally? Like, what would that look like from a post standpoint? Right, so let's say I'm on LinkedIn and there's an attorney I work with and they posted something to their law firm website. Hey, you know, we just had a nice settlement. I'll comment on it. I'll use someone's name specifically, or I'll tag another attorney in it and be like, hey, this is a case is similar to your case, maybe you guys. So I'm networking them, and then they network me. I think that's a really good point. In the digital world, being the connector, well, just in general, not just the yeah. digital world, being the connector. And I also like that you brought up, I think there's a lot of pressure of like, what do I post? I'm, you know, like LinkedIn's intimidating, what do I post? But what I'm hearing you say is it's not so much about what she's posting, it's about engaging and commenting and connecting. I think right. we take for granted how impactful yeah. and powerful that is. Tag other trying. people, tag your important people, why not? I mean, even if they don't reply back, someone is gonna see that you're friends with that person. Mm -hmm. Oh, you tagged Rachel Montez. I'm working with her on a case, or she just beat me in a trial. Like, I'm like, oh, what's that about? about? It's, it's just about, you know, it's really just networking. That's interesting. I've never yeah. thought about LinkedIn as a the, the you know, digital networking. Right. I'm always thinking about these kind of things. Yeah. So that's a really interesting thing. This takeaway. is better. Yes, this is better. And I just finally went to my first, well, since the pandemic, I was in Houston for an attorney's conference. A thousand attendees. There were like four people wearing masks because they're yeah. medical professionals. Um, oh my God, everyone was so happy to just be around people yeah. again. But it, it has to be so intimidating. Can you imagine being in an event with a thousand people? No. Yeah. For me, that would be very intimidating. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love it. Going back to what I was saying about the democratization, I don't even know if that's a word, so I hope I'm not butchering it. Um, <laughs> Of um, being able to get in front of your audience, but then having to cut through the noise because everyone can get get there. Mm -hmm. I think an industry that's really been disrupted because of this, which Dan, I know you're going to appreciate this conversation, mm -hmm. is the publishing industry. Yes. You know, years ago to publish a book, you know, you had to get in front of the big. I don't even know what the big publishers are. Right. To be able to have a book published. What I love is that these days you can become a published author um, by self-publishing, mm -hmm. or there's hybrid publishing, like. So uh, weirdly enough, Rise has a publishing arm called On The Rise Press. So we are a hybrid publishing arm. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's interesting because you have yeah. published a book I and know. I believe you've published it traditionally. I did. But I'm curious and to hear about that experience in case anyone's ever wanting to publish a book. And then so much about publishing these days is about having a large platform, right? Mm -hmm. And so how did you market your book and all that good right. stuff? Okay, so there's so much to I'm a show and tell kind of girl. To talk about publishing, and there's a reason why I brought so many books, okay. because I want to tell you guys, whether you publish through a publisher or you self-publish, there is no consistency in print or quality. So you might order 10 books, and you'll get 10 books, and then a month later you order 10 books, and they look completely different. So, because they're just coming from print-on-demand sources. Well, and that's why, like, with On The Rise Press, we use the mm -hmm. same, we, we found a right. local person, and, because I'm too OCD for that. I, I would lose my mind. Oh. But, yeah. No, yeah, I'm most, no. yeah. Oh, girl, I can hook you up. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Like, you do an on-demand thing. Uh -huh. It's absolutely what you're talking about. Exactly. And so, even my publisher uses print-on-demand. So, there's two things, I'm, well, I want to talk to you about how I got into writing my book and the publishing experience, but another thing, your, your word you made up, democratization. Yeah, I'm mad at it. Um, I'm a bad teacher, I get a pass. Okay, well, okay, good. Good. <laughs> yeah, not only does it mean that anyone can publish a book, it also means that anyone can publish
the shabak. Yeah. Like, right? <laughs> quality, you know, quantity is not right. actually quality. So my fear in publishing a guide for attorneys and law students was that if I didn't have an actual publisher, it wasn't going to be legit. It wasn't going to carry sort of the backing of yes, a publisher is publishing my book because they know that it has good quality. Yeah, and I'm gonna pause because I think a lot of people maybe have never considered a publishing book and it may not be relevant. What made you want to publish a book? And what is the value of publishing a book? If, uh -huh. you know, if I'm in finance or you know, somebody else, right. why would somebody like that want to publish a book? I have so many reasons for publishing the book. Um, because I present a lot and I teach a lot to medical students, art students, um, medical illustration students and attorneys, I'm always sort of giving the same spiel again and again and again. And nobody knows what a medical illustrator is, so I have to tell it again and again and again, like sometimes daily. And I was prepping for a presentation and I was like, I should just write all this down and print it. And the next time some jerk comes up to me in a bar and is like, hey, what do you do? I'll be like, read the book. <laughs> um, so there was a little bit of that. There was also um, an innate desire to teach, and to because the field is so small, I wanted more people to know about it. I wanted like college counselors and other people, mentors that help guide students into jobs to know about this field. Um, and also, I don't have any children, so it's kind of like leaving a legacy in a profession that I love. And yeah. And, <laughs> Oh, so originally I was like, I want to write the book because I just want to tell people to screw off and just like, <laughs> read the book. But um, I thought about writing it as a textbook for law school because mm -hmm. no longer do law schools teach basic anatomy or really promote the field of injury law. And I was like, okay, I have 10 really good cases. Each chapter will be a case. And I'll just teach law students, maybe they'll hire me to teach a summer elective at BU, and I'll teach basic anatomy and visual storytelling. And I'll talk about how having the illustration, not only in court, but during mediation or during the deposition, how this made the case so much more successful and so much more simple and easier to teach and educate the law, lay audience. And it, of course, I'm like, no one's gonna hire me to teach at law schools every summer. Like, oh, let's pay Annie a bunch of money to come teach at Baylor Law this summer. Like, it's just not gonna happen. I bet it did. So, <laughs> I see where this goes. So, I, <laughs> I was like, this is going somewhere. So, I kept writing the book, and it became very autobiographical. Mm. It's more of a nonfiction mm. memoir. It's about the entire medical illustration legal, like it's like a tell-all. Wow. So if you're interested in medical malpractice cases and lawsuits, it's very interesting. Obviously some of it is very gory. I was just like, started flipping through it and I was like, and done. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Some of it is very entertaining. Um, I've had a couple of medical illustrators read it that know of me, they know who I am. And they're like, I laugh the entire time because I can tell, like, you're being so sarcastic, you know? <laughs> and so it's funny and... So you found a publisher, I they found published a publisher. it, and then, and then what? Because I think that's the thing people forget. Like once, the writing the book is a big list, mm -hmm. but then once the book is out, then what? Right, exactly. So I finished the book before I had found a publisher. There were specific publishers I was sort of like, that I wanted to take the book. I like how I courted you. <laughs> yes. And so I hired my own editor, and it actually was not as expensive as I was afraid. As I was afraid it was going to be very expensive. It wasn't that bad. She was great. So then I felt really confident with the manuscript. And I finally found a publisher. They were like, oh, well, just send us your three best chapters. And then I got like completely, you know perfection, paranoid, like, okay, I'm gonna take my three best chapters, now I have to edit them again, I have to change them again, and all this stuff. Um, but anyway, they accepted the book, and I was part of a writing group here in Denver oh, that's called, um, what are they called? But they teach people how to self-publish. And I went to one of their things, and they were telling me, don't go through a publisher, do this, do this, do this, 
but then you have to find your own printer, you have to print all your own books, you have to store all your own books, you have to ship all your own books, you have to receive the books back from customers that have damaged books and send them back out. You have to get your, um, I always say it wrong, your ISBN number, you have to do your copywriting, you have to do everything and your marketing. And That's I was, why I I'm like, well, well, if I'm working with attorneys, maybe I should use publisher. I know that I'm only going to get a percentage of the book. So I only get a 15% royalty off all the books. It's very small. Is that net? But I don't or? have to deal with printing them. I don't have to deal with selling them. I don't have to deal with shipping them. Nothing. Which is really nice. And I was like, great. They'll sell my book. They'll market it too. No, not really. They have like 100,000 titles. And my book is like not important to them. So regardless of what you do, you will still have to sell your own book. Yeah. You'll have to market your own book. And what I've noticed is now that everyone does print on demand because everyone can print on their own, you will see all of these books look completely different. Um, so these two are paperbacks. One is thicker than the other. So all of these came in one shipment, all of these came in another shipment, and this one isn't even printed straight. Right? So this is what you get. And then these are the hardbacks. You can tell it's like even printed at a different size. And then the color is completely different. So on one cover, you can kind of see the box in the back, which yeah. should be darker. And this one is so green, the box has disappeared. So that's another thing. Whether you self-publish or you're even working with a professional publisher, yeah, it's... It's tricky. Unpredictable. Well, I think that's part of the digital age, right? You're tr it's trade-off. Convenience over quality. Sometimes it's going to happen. So how do you navigate that? Right. And then the last thing I want to ask before I open it up and give you guys time to network, you, you mentioned something, visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's something as a professional, no matter what industry you're in, that's, we hear a lot about in marketing, storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. But I, I think it's interesting to think about it from a visual storyteller. Right. So what does that mean and how do I apply that to my business? The only thing we all do is look at our phones. And if we're talking about some something to someone, we're like, oh, let me Google it really fast, I'll show you. Everything is visual. Oh, I was doing this on vacation, blah, blah, blah. Oh, let me show you the pictures. So if you're giving a lecture about a dog, you better have a picture of the dog. Because <laughs> that how, is how we turn we that to professional. All... Like if I'm a finance person or in marketing and sales, yeah. like what would visual storytelling look Use like? Use a, a visual, even if you just have your logo in the room while you're speaking. Or um, there were some girls at the conference I was just at, I was so impressed. Their exhibit booth was green, and every day they wore something green, so you always remembered who they were and where they belonged. Mm -hmm. And they had like little airplane bottles of booze that were all the different green labels. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about remembering visually. You know, mm -hmm. what is it will you remember? Um, Emily and I were talking last night about all my boyfriend's new neighbors and how to remember everyone's name. And there was a woman that I met one day, like literally on movie day, and I was, I met so many people, and I was trying to remember their names. Her name was Kelly, and she was wearing green yoga pants. And I was like, Kelly, green yoga pants. <laughs> you know? And so we all think visually. So why would you present to someone without a visual? Because that's how they remember. So the second chapter in the book is about an illustration that I showed at the Art Institute of Colorado. I was giving a lecture to the animation department. We were talking about different things. And four years later, I was in a coffee shop with a bunch of people writing, working on the book. And she had sat down. And the host of our writing group, he's like, well, let me really quick introduce you to everyone. And he got to me, he goes, Annie's a medical illustrator. She's like, I know you. You show me this like head with this like neck. And she even remembered the crash and what had happened to the person four years later because it was a visual. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to yeah. anything, something. I agree. Yeah. I think that's really re relevant. Well, yay! I was gonna say, well, questions uh, before I give you time to network. Cause I have she's a question like, about your book. So like when you're talking about digital and stuff, like do people ever buy a digital copy? Yes, I have an ebook. So, uh, like, well, I've never actually seen it, but there's I was going to say, is there like a discrepancy there where you're like, oh, I feel like you're missing out on something for not having a tangible in my hands? Right. Because the book is full of. Don't show the gross ones. 
because like it's all about pictures, right? And it's right. about visual storytelling. So there's a lot of pictures. It kind of becomes like a really cool, gross coffee table book that you can have <laughs> out at Halloween. Um, but it's different than you know just having a digital. You know, you take in the information and then you set it aside because it is full of pictures, and you can go back to the pictures. And it is nice to see the pictures. And most of my attorneys that have this book. They actually don't even prefer the hardback. They prefer the softback because they can write in it and they can get oh, in it and they can dog ear yeah. and they can, you know. Um, no, let me see if I. I know it's so what I'm hearing you say is the ebook uh, takes away from the experience, and I think that it, it is does. often the case yeah. with digital. Is that depending on what you're trying to, are you just trying to digest content or are you? Is it an experience? And it's or not an audio book. <laughs> yeah, so numbers is very interesting. So there are a handful of attorneys that are dyslexic and none of them read. They all listen to audiobooks. So what I've done already on my website is I have every image by chapter in a password protected gallery. Wow. And my intent is to record an audiobook and then give that password to everyone that listens to the book. So I need to do that. I have like well, hold you account. four friends locally that have published before that have audiobooks, and I ask them all individually text. What is it like to record an audiobook? Is it expensive? How long does it take? Where do you do it? Blah blah blah. I got four completely different answers. But yeah, that's on my uh, the to do list. Well, we'll all ask about it, Julia. Yeah. So are you teaching at law school? She will. Let's put it out there. You know anyone? No, but I did get DU Law does now have a copy. Yes. yes. Phyllis. Do you know Renee Zaburg? I don't. She's locally. She she's the only one that's in a related field that I've ever met. She makes um, anatomically correct skeletons. I know her husband. Yes, they do the clay method. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I okay. have met her husband. That is the that coolest is stuff. Yeah. So she's the only other one yeah. that you know. I've never yeah. heard of amazing. Anatomy and play. play. Yeah. yeah. They are great people and they also have a really cool amount of space that you can rent. Well, that's yeah. an example of Denver and how yeah. interconnected it is. Yeah. Do you have a question, Mary? Question. Are you going to do the audio part or are you going Ooh, to that's do that's a good question, Mary. Mary. Yeah, because I love audiobooks and it always sells me when the author actually yeah. narrates it. So yeah, because I want the sarcasm yeah. to come through as well in the right spots. So fun. Yeah. Well, I hope, let's round of applause for me. Now, I know that none of you are medical illustrators, but I hope that we were able to accomplish on two goals. Remember that I want you to walk away having met someone new or having a deeper connection with somebody and learn something. So while you learned a lot about a field you never heard of, so I know you learned that, I hope you learned something you can put into play with your business, whether that's visual storytelling, whether it's leveraging LinkedIn, or when you present, leave the words off. So those are three takeaways you can potentially yeah. take home and utilize in your business. Uh, next Thursday is our uh, food for, uh, food what do we call it? Feed your mind. Feed your mind, so all these new names and stuff. Mm -hmm. Feed your mind, it's during lunchtime. Uh, our zoo, who's one of our members who has a, a she's oh, amazing. Her background's in corporate, but then she became an investor in startup. And then after helping so many people start companies and really amazing companies, she, like I can, I mean, I, uh, Dan, I'm taking some liberties. I assume that's what she thought, but like, I think this yes. is how it all went down. Yeah. You know, I can do it too. So she started a company that originally was called Dispatch Mom, which I kind of interpret as kind of a marketplace for moms to get the support that they like need. concierge service. Thank you. Yes, I knew I wasn't doing justice. But then there's a lot of women that, um, you know, ultimately don't have kids that also need it. So she has recently rebranded it to Call Emmy. And I just think I, the world of her, and I think it'll be really interesting hearing what it was like to start a tech company, essentially, in the middle of a pandemic, yeah. and what apps and tools she used to really get this off the ground. Because again, this month, all the program is around the uh, business in the digital age. So I really hope to see you. Well, actually, I won't be here because I'll be at a men's thought conference. But I really I'll hope you here. come, <laughs> and Annie, Anna Marie will hold down the floor um, next Thursday at noon. Every time you come to program, any of our members that come to programming are entered into a drawing for a free hydrofacial each month. Um, and if you bring a guest, you brought a guest, um, you're entered again. Um, and so we just are really excited about bringing back programming and I hope you enjoyed hearing from Annie as much as I did. Next month I'll be interviewing um, for the Fireside Chat, Carla Rains. 
because next month the theme is all about creativity and innovation. And Carla Raines is incredible as a businesswoman, but then also if you ever walk into her office, she has stunning art all over the place. So I think it's really interesting to see how she's merging the worlds of creativity and innovation. Well, thank you all for coming. Enjoy each other. And uh, you still have like nine minutes to hang out and enjoy each other. So, yay! Awesome. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.